Okay, folks, let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Cushwood Room now, and welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology. This week, we'll be discussing two seminal articles on adult stills disease. I'm going to be joined by two friends. Michael, Bella, turn on your, micro, your, uh, your cameras. Um, I'm joined by Bella Meta and Michael Weissman, and we're going to go over um, what we think is the two articles that you need to look at and read to understand this particular disorder. Everyone's got an opinion. There are a lot of things written about the disorder, but um, I was pleased when Michael said, Michael, tell me what, tell, tell everyone what you told me on Saturday about, about the Bywaters paper. It's the only paper you need to read in all of rheumatology. Read that paper, you're done. Yeah. That's it. That's all you need to read. It it's got really... everything in it. It's like the movie Miracle on 34th Street. You know, you see that movie, the original movie with Edmund Gwen, who played Santa Claus. And uh, you see that movie, that's all you need to know about business. Okay. It, it, it's amazing how um, articles back then, which could only really do descriptive rheumatology, um, and uh, were so accurate in what they described. So um, we'll introduce ourselves and then get right into this. I'm Jack Cush in Dallas, Texas. Bella? I am Bella Mehta from New York. I see a lot of still disease patients. And Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Wiseman from Los Angeles. Okay, folks, let's get into this particular um, presentation. I think you're going to find this really uh, quite interesting. Okay, here we go. All right, so... Michael Bella, you can see uh, that great screen and introduction. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to really present these two articles um, and ask for input from our stills experts and some historical perspective on this topic. So, you know, the stills disease begins in the turn of the century with George F. Still describing 22 patients, kids with a form of arthritis. Not all of them had the systemic disease that gets the name stills disease. They really had... JRA, JIA, and a subset of them had some systemic features. Not well described were the rash and the fever, but there was arthritis and then it was splenomegaly and anemia and lymphadenopathy and th things like that. But this goes back to even a few years before that and art articles in Lancet talking about the uh, systemic and febrile presentation of rheumatoid arthritis. It wasn't until 1933 that Boldero in the Scandinavian Journal of Rheumatology, I think it was, Oh, actually, that's Otto Mulkey in 33, did stills disease in adults, and Boldero described the stills rash. In 1943, the French literature talks about the whistler Fanconi syndrome, or subsepsis hyperallergica, which is stills disease. In 1956, Bywaters and, and Isdale described the rash of JRA, or stills. Um, but the two articles we're talking about today are Bywaters in 1971, Annals of Rheumatic Disease, describing 14 women with this condition. And then two years later, the group uh, from Shelley Wolf, um, authored by Joseph Bujak in the journal Medicine, described 10 males with Stills disease. There are other really important papers. Um, Wallace Christie and Tom Metzger describing a 50% chance of carpal ankylosis in Stills disease. John Goldman in Atlanta was one of the first people to actually describe his cohort, and, but he had criteria for the diagnosis, so that's notable. And then John Asdale in Vancouver did a really important case series, six cases in American Journal of Medicine, but he looked at the literature and sort of put it all together and talked about the liver disease. Anyway, like Michael said, if you read those first two articles, 71, 73, you've really got it down. So Eric Bywaters, I was lucky enough to have met when I was a, a fellow, uh, and Michael's going to give us some of his perspective on Bywaters, who he knew, who he, know, he, he knew, but he had been working on this issue for a while. If you read the paper, they talk about a lot of the kids that uh, and people hospitalized in Taplow and Hammersmith in the UK were, were, that were different from seropositive RAs. They were younger, they were milder, they were seronegative. They had other features and, and that they later said were akin to um, JRA. Yes, many of them went on to develop other conditions, but they had this cohort that they followed and collected over a 20 year period. So they went on to say that Stills disease does occur in the adults. 
And again, you should know that back in the 50s and maybe 60s and before, Still's disease could mean JRA or JIA across the board, all the subsets. It's only been really since about the time of, of, of Bywaters, the 70s and 80s, that we've adopted the systemic variant to be called or be named after George F. Still. So they talked about their 14 patients that were collected. You know, a bunch of them had longstanding disease. And, um, and over this 20 year period, one seen in Hammersmith and Taplow, 14 out of 680 um, had this condition that we call Still's disease. So in leading up to this, I, I talked to Michael, I talked to a lot of people, Tony Fauci, Peter Lipsky, and I got this email from Art Weinstein. Um, Art is at Georgetown. Um, and he's semi-retired. He said in 1971, he was in his second year as an honest, honorary registrar at the Hammersmith Hospital. One day he was discussing some patients with Eric Bywaters, one of his mentors, and he pulled out his newly published article in, in, uh, in Alzheimer's Magazine on adult stills. It reminded me of a case he had seen in Toronto a few years earlier when a young woman with fever, leukocytosis, high sed rate, LFTs, a rash, arthralgias, back pain, you know, every, all the workup was negative and whatnot. And he realized at that point that was probably Stills disease and he missed it. Of course, the patient did well on steroids, later defervest and whatnot. He said ever since he's been looking for these amongst his FUO patients. When I asked John Esdale about this, he said the great thing about Stills disease is that the diagnosis rests solely on clinical findings and a few simple lab tests. You don't need, you know, a lot of expensive testing. And he believes that this is something that rheumatologists should confirm as a diagnosis. Um, Michael, you responded to Art Weinstein's email. Tell us your own story. Well, in 1971, which was the beginning of my two-year fellowship with Nate Zweifler, and I don't know if anybody on this call remembers Nate, but they should. Uh, we call him Nate the Great. He was an amazing character. Uh, and he had a Thursday night clinic. He said, because at Georgetown, where he was before he came to UCSD, patients needed to work during the day and they needed to go to the doctor in the evening. So we had a Thursday night clinic and this woman, I remember Sylvia F was her name. She, she was around 40 year, 42 years old. She came in with fever and rash and large joint polyarthritis and had, this had been going on for a number of years and we got x-rays of her wrists and hands, and sure enough, it showed the jo widespread joint space narrowing and some carpal ankylosis. And, and Nate told me about this paper that had just come out in uh, Animals Rheumatic Diseases. And there was Eric Bywater's paper that described her to a T. Now, the other thing Nate did was he invited Eric Bywater's to come and spend time with us. And he did. Uh, Eric came and he was visiting professor at UCSD for most of a week. And we got to know him very well. What an amazing individual he was. And as I, I don't think people on the call uh, really appreciate is that the way things were done in uh, England in those days was that uh, you as a rheumatologist followed your patients all the way from beginning to death and you actually performed an autopsy on your patients. Hmm. So you became an amateur pathologist as well as a diagnostician. So you saw the patient all the way from the beginning to the end. So when you read Eric Bywater's papers, there's always pathology. You remember, he described the pathology of rheumatoid nodules and rheumatoid vasculitis because he was the consummate physician from beginning to end. There are lots of stories we could take up the whole hour and talk about Eric Bywater's and we don't wanna do that because everybody's missing the, uh, the baseball all-star game. So we have to kind of cut this discussion <laughs> a little bit short, Jack, and, uh, and just say that uh, maybe another time we could talk about the impact of Eric Bywaters on rheumatology. Yeah. One other comment though about his paper is that not only did he describe adult stills, but he also described the difference between that and seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the few people that actually pulled out of rheumatoid arthritis all of what we call seronegative spondyloarthritis today. And he's described that as completely distinct from rheumatoid arthritis. Now, that was not accepted in the United States even up to 1971. And that was because of 
a, an individual at the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, who was the, the, the consummate rheumatologist and trained many people in, in the United States. Uh, and he refused to accept the difference between rheumatoid arthritis and the seronegative spondylar arthritis individuals. But Eric Bywart has made it very clear in this paper in 1971 uh, that this was, uh, these were distinct clinical entities. Yeah, and very important uh, historically for the evolution. So here's one of the, the first um, figures in the paper, and I want the audience um, not to take it all in, but look, look at specific columns. Look at the third column, age of onset. Um, the age here ranges, they're in their 20s for the most part, and ranges from a young of 17 to the oldest of 35. That's still the disease in the adult. You know, when you start making diagnoses at 50 and 63 and whatnot, you're out on a limb, if you, if, if you ask me. Look at the joints. This is a little bit different than what was said in the Bujak paper, where they said there wasn't so much arthritis, but there was a fair amount of, our, of joint involvement, although Bywaters did call this fleeting, and only in a few cases was it chronic uh, and progressive. Um, and you can see that in the next column next to it, where they're talking about the number who develop either carpal uh, involvement or erosive disease and whatnot. And then look at the far right column with other. You can see all the other things that we know to be true in this condition, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, pericarditis, other forms of serositis. Um, you know, there's some strange things in here. There's neck involvement, there's TB of the lung uh, or, or TB of the spine. Um, someone, one person goes on to arthroplasty, a few patients lose hair. So let's get into that a little bit, but um, I think that this really shows you even back here in the 50s and 60s when these patients were collected, um, they really well characterized the syndrome. I think so. I think he's uh, characterized the syndrome well, but I want to say the comment on like, these are younger patients. There's definitely another peak of Stills disease, which we see there's a later um, you know, after 50s also that you see some patients. Let's, let's, let's get back to that because I think that that's a really important point. And Bella, uh, uh, Bella's perspective on this is wise because she studied this. She studied, you know, and actually has, you know, the codes and, you know, population-based data to back that up. And um, so I think it's something we should discuss towards the end. Um, these are the key features from this article. The presentation age was seven to th 17 to 35. They, they said the rash would appear and disappear and then reappear often with fevers and often at 6 p.m. So one of the, I think is an important part of the disease. It's a quotidian disease with a circadian pattern to fever. It's really unlikely, really uncommon to have fever early in the morning. These are late day, late at night fevers. Along friction lines, the, 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 the feature of, of, of um, uh, not derma dermatographism and, and um, oh, what's the other one? Isomorphic lesions. Um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the term. But, but again, you can get this along creases and bra straps and whatnot. Rarely itchy, but some people do get urticaria. And it's a sort of a static lesion, set of lesions or maculopapular eruptions that come and go. Um, it doesn't spread like rheumatic fever. Again, think of 1971. There's a lot of references to what was big on their minds at that time, which was rheumatic fever. The fever, they said, is dramatic. It can, it can be confused with sepsis. Um, they said it either had a quotidian or a remittent pattern, quotidian meaning fever that goes back to baseline in the same day remittent stays with a high baseline and then spikes up to 102 or higher. They said that the joint involvement it was peripheral, fleeting, occasionally chronic or erosive, was both large and small, small joints. They talked about hip involvement and DIP involvement. And again, they did show three patients with carpal involvement, two with cervical involvement. Again, in the time, the at the time, there was a lot of discussion about cervical and or SI involvement in these kind of conditions. And that goes to Dr. Weissman's point about distinguishing this from the other patients went on to develop seronegative spondyl arthritis. Hair fall, not uncommon with high fevers, pericarditis, pleuritis, splenomegaly. And at the time they were using Rose Waller tests to look for rheumatoid factor or the, that then version of rheumatoid factor. And it was negative in 13 out of the 14 patients. So that was, those are the key features. Um, anyone want to comment on that? You know, Jack, there's another, we used to have two other key features. Uh, one was that the house staff would always miss the rash because they'd be going home at the end of the afternoon 
when the rash you know, would appear. So that was one of the features. And the other feature was if the infectious disease doctors absolutely refused to accept the fact that this was not an infection, you knew that was a criteria for the diagnosis of adult stills. Yeah, those both great points because yeah, usually when the house staff came back on in the morning, they were not going to have their fever, which meant they were none likely to have their rash. Um, and yeah, I think right now, most of our cases of stills disease come from ID consults. When they're done doing their work, then they're handing it off to you and making your life easier, which is very different, Michael, than what you were doing back in the 70s and 80s when these people came in with horrific stories of workups and evaluations that went on for months and years and specialty services and lymphangiograms and laparotomies. And when I did the review at University of Pittsburgh of their 23 patients, I was shocked at the, the stories that led to the diagnosis. Was that your experience? Of course. And I wonder if Bella had the same experiences I did. You know, we, we wrote a paper some years ago about sore throat that occurred in uh, adult stills, which was really very common. And that always got confused with rheumatic fever and, and, these, and these patients always got antibiotics. So that also, that whole scenario also delayed patients getting a, a proper diagnosis. Bella, did you, did you I see think, that? I think even right now, sometimes I see patients who have been referred from specialist to specialist, hematology, bone marrow biopsies, lots of crazy workup before a simple ferritin or a simple, uh, you know, referral is done. Like there are times I've had patients who have not got diagnosis for two years. Average time to diagnosis, even in some studies, is like three or four months, which is, which is still something in this day and age with everything available. Yeah. So and that the was other a thing comment. that was characteristic was if you just ask one simple question, which is, did the fever come down to normal within a twenty-four hour period? So all you needed to do was to look at the fever chart. And if it came down to normal every 24 hours, you know, there are not that many infectious diseases that would do that. Right. Or other causes of fever and doesn't happen usually with lupus. So, you know, this, that, was a, that was a real important clue. Uh, in the old days when they had these, you have these written fever charts. Uh, and well, I, I, want, I want to follow up on what um, Michael and Bella said. Michael representing what I think what happened in the 70s and 80s, where it was the rule that they had horrific workups and lengthy uh, uh, periods without a diagnosis. And, and Bella points out that it still happens today. But today, the big challenge is patients with two weeks or two months of fever, and we're being asked to make the diagnosis. And that makes it more challenging. That's more likely these days. Here are some figures from the, the paper. Um, let me see if I have that. That's the original fever. I want to point out that obviously that spiking fever that goes down to goes down to baseline normal and uh, and then up um, uh, above 103. And, and again, really should be above 102 to be considered uh, 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 the spiking fever of stills. But notice that when they add in salicylate in high doses, the fever pattern changes. If you add in a steroid in any dose, the fever pattern will change. Um, this patient had a rub and then again, a, a recurrence that one way when the patient was treated, but back then that's all they had was aspirin. This was one of their cases in the middle, you're looking at carpal ankylosis and it's not fully ankylosed, early ankylosis between, and, and the, in between the capitate and the second, maybe third um, base of the metacarpal. But uh, this was described by Metzger and Christie where it's pericapitate distribution of joint space loss that leads to carpal ankylosis. So the capitate fuses to the metacarpals, fuses to the scaphoid or lunate or to the hamate laterally. Again, this is a very typical pattern. And then the, on the right, I think what you're seeing that's important and instructive is active disease and then disease-free intervals. And that is a typical feature of Stills disease. Um, now, not every patient has a so-called polycyclic disease, but that is typical of the disorder. Any comment from my um, discussions? Well, I, I mean, salicylate, I've never used salicylate in these sort of doses. I mean, again, I am from, from a, a different, different era, era uh, of rheumatology. So just looking at, you know, how they were treating it, I was like, you know, there's liver toxicities and all of that, that they're trying to monitor. And they're saying, hey, we did this, we did a good job with 
liver toxicities with the salicylated levels. I have no experience of this. Um, oh, uh, it's interesting. Bella, you know that it, in those days, at least in the 60s, or maybe in the 50s, all we had was bed rest and salicylates until your ears rang. And then you, and then you cut back on the dose. And that was the standard treatment all right. for all forms of rheumatoid arthritis. Right. Uh, really until, uh, until, of course, the, uh, the discovery of cortisone and how everything got turned around in the early 50s when then uh, steroids were, were becoming the baseline treatment for... Yep. Uh, for the goal diseases. of therapy was uh, ringing the ears, but really blood levels where you were trying to get 25 to 30 milligrams um, per uh, ml as a dose, and that was your therapeutic range. Um, we'll get into that in the next paper as well. The outcomes are pretty typical. Two out of 14 had progressive crippling arthritis. One required bilateral hip replacement. Um, and they were important to uh, clear to say that everybody had a, was, became normal and were leading a full life. And a few got married and are having kids. Um, and that most who had joint involvement, which was seen in most, it was transient and sometimes remittent. Um, and, and he said that sometimes what was the most troublesome symptom to manage was the malaise, fever, and rash that sometimes persisted in patients. And then lastly, the complications of steroid use when steroids became available and were being used, that psychiatric disturbance was a, a, not an uncommon story. So again, some very key features here, including the, uh, the prospect of normalcy. You know, no one should really die from Stills disease if they don't get MAS or they don't get steroid toxicity. Those are the two main ways that patients will die um, with steroids. And when I say steroid toxicity, get the consequences of chronic high dose steroid use. So the next paper was by Joe Joseph Bujak. And, and I, I did reach out to um, Tony Fauci and Peter Lipsky because they, they were both at the NIH at the time that Shelley Wolf was there. Shelley Wolf was a famous individual known for his work in fever. Um, he's an infectious disease person. Um, um, and, and, and le led to a lot of great careers. And this, he was a senior author on this paper. Both uh, Fauci and um, Lipsky said that Bujak was assigned the, this project of reviewing all these cases and putting it together into a report. Um, but you know, this group that was working on fever became very important in description of Wegener's and FMF and auto-inflammatory conditions and later the interferonopathies and basically led to the current, you know, auto-inflammatory clinic. That's a big deal at the NIH run by Rafaela Goldbach Mansky and Dan, and Dan Kastner. So again, um, there's a real history here. It's important. N neither Fauci or Lipsky knew, knew what happened to Joe Bujak. Um, I, I assume he, 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 like many of us went into practice, but, um, but again, his, his he, he's given the credit for this particular paper, which was also seminal different from the first one in that this was all, the first one was 14 women, this was 10 men. And that was one of the early arguments between those who were talking about discussion. Is this a disease of men or is this a disease of women? Clearly, well, Jack, you know, this points out What's that? something really interesting about the kind of patients that get referred to the NIH. Okay, they're not the same as the patients that get referred to you in your practice uh, or to see Bella in New York. This is a different group of patients. Uh, if you think of Sjogren's and the way Sjogren's was described at the NIH in the 1950s and 60s, remember, you know, 20% of them had lymphomas. I mean, th this was a very different group of patients. So I think you have to keep that in mind when you look at these NIH clinical re reports from the clinical uh, group, from the clinical group there, which brings me to ask Bella the question, you know, I, this business about this being a benign disease and patients doing well, you know, with therapy, that's not been my experience. Bella, what, what's your experience with this? Don't, I mean, I, I would want to say like, there's a percent who do very well, like maybe a good percent, 50%. But there's another 50% that are going into complications, MAS on and off. And it's, 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 not an, it's not like, oh, you get a diagnosis, you get treated and you're fine. There's a lot more watch, you know, there's a lot of uh, watching of these patients to do, a lot of monitoring. Yeah. What about the, uh, the, this, the material now that we're learning from our pediatric colleagues uh, that there are delayed hypersensitivity reactions 
to IL-1, anti-IL-1 and anti-IL-6 inhibitors that have a genetic predisposition uh, that, uh, that may occur in these patients and they'll get severe lung disease. Uh, and in fact, they do very badly when they get these hypersensitivity reactions to these drugs. What's been your experience, Bella? With, with, with I think uh, with, there's, there's another group of patients who have mast cell activation with stills um, that's diagnosed by allergists and whatnot. And sometimes these patients are totally biologic naive and they're still getting these crazy allergic reactions or hypersensitivity reactions. So I'm not quite sure what the exact mechanism is. Um, there's definitely much more patients that I see with these sort of reactions now, but no, I haven't seen much with lung sort of involvement because so of the, hypersensitivity. The, the story on lung disease is that certainly that 40% of patients will have, um, you know, pleuritis and 20% will have pneumonitis, but there is a subset and it was written about, it's been written about back into the eighties, um, of chronic lung co- uh, disease occurring in still disease. Now, is that just you know, casual bystander effects, people developing COPD or ILD for other reasons, or is the ILD related to the stills inflammation? Um, there are some who believe that the pulmonary hypertension occurs in stills disease, sometimes as a consequence of cytokine inhibition, mainly IL-1 inhibition. Um, but there are a lot of unresolved issues, including the one that Michael brings up from the Stanford group that's, that's basically showed a dress syndrome that had a particular um, HLA association um, and was associated with eosinophilia and whatnot. Now, uh, again, this, that, that kind of work needs more effort and needs to be reproduced. But I think, and it's, and it's really all the buzz in the pediatric literature in stills that maybe there's something, there's, a, there's a, a, a really bad lung variant out there that can be another reason why these, these people may do poorly. But without that, without MAS, the only reason a patient would still should do poorly was uh, from chronic arthritis, which the numbers historically have been about 25%, usually not more than 30% that would develop a seronegative polyarthritis that would look just like RA and behave like seronegative RA, which generally means pretty severe. But it's important to, Jack, to, uh, to maybe put a link in, in, uh, uh, in your program to Vivian Safer's article in Animals Rheumatic Diseases, where she described uh, the uh, subset of patient with stills Developing dress syndrome to anakinra, canakinumab, golonosept, and and uh, and tocilumumab. These patients did very poorly, and they almost all had this HLA DRB one fifteen alleles. And this is a striking finding, uh, and very important in terms of management of these patients. Maybe you know, give everybody a link to that to that Amos paper. I think it was published, you know, in the fall of twenty twenty one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very important paper. Everyone should. I mean, should read it. just just another argument. Even in the Bujak paper, I think there were three patients who had eosinophilia. So these were, I mean, at that point, they were not getting exposed to any of this. Right. Yeah, it's it's been described. Um, the the eosinophilia. I I did for the group. I did give you the two citations where you can download both the Bujak and the Bywaters article, and then I'll post on Room Now. Um, this article that uh, Dr. Weissman is referring to, I think it's another report. We did cover it in room now, but it probably goes back about a year now that that, that, that came out. So but we'll, we'll, we'll post that up again for people to see. So let's get into the particulars of the Bujak article. Um, they did, um, uh, as you can see, it started in 1973. And as Michael said, it's a special population. So the, F, the, the NIH was following about 200 FUO patients and of their 210 fit this particular profile of JRA with systemic features, they called it again, JRA back then, and, or Stills disease, they were all male. Um, half of them had an onset um, during um, childhood with a mean onset at age 6.8 years. The other half had an onset at 21 years of age. And you can look at the, the table on the right the, about the features that are being displayed here, right? Um, the, um, the, the, how many had high fevers? I mean, all of them had high fevers. Uh, adenopathy and splenomegaly in most. Uh, pneumonitis, so very high compared to other, other series of 60%. Pericarditis, that's about right. Sore throat, that's about the right number. And John Esdale pointed out to me, this is probably one of the first articles 
to really highlight the sore throat as a distinguishing feature. And of course, that's a prodromal. It's at the onset of disease when they're having fever and the onset that they will often present with sore throat. And that will abate as they get more and more into the condition. Um, and so you'll see all, uh, all, they all had polyarthralgias, but true arthritis that lasted was only in five out of the 10. On the bottom left is a table they had looking at asymptomatic intervals in those who had recurrent disease. And again, I think that's an important feature of this disease that it is a condition that, uh, and I don't know the right answer. I've always said, when people say, how long is this going to last? I say eight months to eight years, and I think I'm close, but, and that's just based on looking at lots of papers, but it can, I think if it lasted three months, I don't know if that really would meet criteria for the diagnosis, but you can see that many patients have long disease-free intervals. The longest one I've seen in the literature was over 40 years. So that is a part and parcel of the condition. It's Let's interesting that, that all of what was described as a dress reaction to these biologic treatments with this haplotype, it all occurred in little bits and pieces, even before, as Bella pointed out, even before we had the biologic drug. Right. Right. So, and that's occur in a lot of our diseases. So they, so that the genetic predisposition may in fact have more to do with the severity, severity of the reaction and the severity of the disease rather than, rather than you know, actually the occurrence itself. And so that, that's why uh, the argument can be made to do genetic testing uh, in this population. But it's an, interesting, it's an interesting part of it. And I'm glad Bella pointed that out. All these things were seen even before we had biologic drugs. But now with the biologic drugs, they're seen to be very severe when they occur yeah. and life-threatening, which was not the case, you know, before biologic, so. So again, the 10 males who, have, who they present, presented, and they give some case reports that you can read their narratives, all of them had a quotidian fever. Nine out of the 10 had a fever greater than 105 as a peak fever. Um, double quotidian was seen in three out of 10 and two out of 10 had a remittent or high baseline pattern. Rash was evanescent in seven, uh, half of them occurred with fevers. And like all the other biopsies that were seen, whether it's the skin biopsy, synovial biopsy, liver biopsies, it's nonspecific inflammation is really nothing that ever has panned out biopsy wise in the diagnosis. Same can be said for the lymphadenopathy, which is generally generalized, but in their seven patients, Three were generalized, two had bilateral inguinal, one was cervical, one was axillary, one had like mesenteric on laparotomy, uh, and the biopsies proved negative. Um, splenomegaly, pericarditis, pleuritis, pneumonitis, hepatomegaly, LFTs, and again, biopsy of the liver showed periportal inflammation. Uh, and then again, the sore throat was a new feature seen in seven out of 10 patients at the time of their febrile diagnosis. Has a sore throat been important for you, Michael and um, Bella, in making the diagnosis? We wrote a paper on it, Jack, with Kathy Nguyen, and we compared it to lupus patients. And lupus patients also get sore throats. Yeah. But, it was, but it was much more common in the adult stills. So, uh, yeah, we, were, we paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, so it doesn't happen in kids, right? Kids with systemic disease? Yes. Um, so, um, you know, I think that that's um, interesting to say the least. Um, the other part of this, of course, is that NIH doctors were fever doctors. They were interested in FUO. Well, Shelley so Wolf, yeah. Yeah, so they maximized the systemic features of the disease and minimized the articular ones. Whereas Bywaters, he was, a, that was an arthritis hospital. You know, Taplow was an arthritis hospital that was started to treat uh, to treat kids with rheumatic fever. And after the war, of course, rheumatic fever went away to some extent, and they were left with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as a group that came. So they, the focus was on arthritis. Right. So depending on your ascertainment bias going in, you're gonna, your, your, your cohort is going to reflect that. The other aspect of this that feeds into what you just said, Michael, is that the triad of Stills disease, the um, quotidian fever, the evanescent rash, and the polyarthritis, of those, polyarthritis, first off, they are seldom all three present at diagnosis and presentation. 
And of, of those, the arthritis may be the one that comes up last uh, and may take some time to really take hold. Um, but there is no set pattern. There are patients who present with arthritis and get the rash, you know, second year in. It's, there's really no specific um, you know, sequence here that must happen to cinch the diagnosis. And the rash looks different in different populations. Yeah. I'm in New York. I see, all, you know, there's a diverse group of people. The rash can look very, very different in certain populations. Um, it doesn't look evanescent and, you know, the typical describing things. Um, I think I go by like this presence of some sort of a rash, which comes with fever mostly, and then you just have to go by it. So if it's faint and salmon pink, it may be a lot harder to see in someone who's Hispanic or African-American. And, and, and the fact that it comes and goes makes it even harder. I, when I met Eric Bywaters, I was just accepted for the fellowship program in Dallas. And he was at a program there. And I was so excited. I cornered him. I'm sure I was a stalker back then. And I asked him, listen, how do you make this diagnosis? It's a tough diagnosis. What can you hang your hat on? And he said, the rash. And he went on to tell me about the importance of the rash. Fast forward like 15 years, I'm at the American Academy of Dermatology meeting. I'm giving a stills lecture to about 2000 dermatologists. And I say the most distinctive part of the rash is the salmon pink evanescent rash. They all booed me. They said, oh my God, it's a morbilliform viral exanthem rash, a knucklehead. And they're right. It is not truly specific but it is different than a lupus rash or a, you know, a leukocytoclastic rash or whatever. So anyway, I was great to be humbled by 2000 dermatologists. You, you know, you should have learned a big lesson to not talk about a rash to a group of dermatologists. <laughs> exactly. 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 I mean, talk about arthritis, something they don't know anything about, Right. but, but leave the skin alone. But <laughs> dermatologists refer a lot of patients to us. That's true. Stills. They, they see that there's something different maybe go to rheumatology. So that's a good referral point. Yeah. So the joint features here are pretty distinctive. Everybody has arthralgias and myalgias at some point. Um, they felt at the NIH that it had to be large joints and not much small joints, but Bywater said quite differently. And I think it is both large and small joints. They said it was transient. Only a few had carpal um, disease, but SI and TMJ was not typical. Um, anybody want to add anything? You know, I think that Cervical ankylosis, Bywaters wrote about, and um, uh, I've seen tarsal ankylosis in the Pittsburgh series that may also be akin to wrist ankylosis or carpal ankylosis. But other than that, I don't think, you know, and there's a few cases with myositis, um, and I think that there could be some confusion and overlap there, but they're, they're very few. Well, you have to separate out what are the acute diagnostic features versus the chronic uh, sequelae having the disease for a while, Jack, you can't, but, but I wanted to find out from Bella, you know, how often do you see these patients? I mean, you come from a center where a lot of difficult cases are going to get referred, right? Special surgery, because it's special, right? So you're going to get these cases. How many per year will you as a rheumatologist specialist in this area be asked to see? What number would you come up you with? You know, maybe two, three years ago, I was getting like two or three patients, four patients um, every quarter, I want to say. But suddenly I see a surge of referrals for stills. I want to say every two weeks, I'm seeing a new patient with stills right now, which is for stills, it's it's a lot. Like I have a cohort, I want to say of 40 or 50 patients now. So there's... And mostly because there, nobody, you know, peripherally, there's people who are like, okay, there's somebody who can manage these patients and they just send them in. Um, but, but I still feel that I don't see a whole lot of ankylosis now. It's like RA, right? In the back in the day, there was much more joint damage uh, before diagnosis or, you know, for treatment. Um, now I feel like there is erosions, but not like fully ankylosis that I see. So that's quite a, quite, a, sure. quite a number of patients you're seeing. Well, yeah, you, I mean, there's been a surge for sure. What do you think that's due to? I, I, think, I, just, I think it's due to Bella's hard work is what that's yeah, due maybe. to because the numbers are very clear. At a teaching hospital like Cedar sinai in LA, the most you're going to see is two cases a year at Cedar sinai right. um, That's right. That's a, that's a population-based sort of numbers here. 
So, but Bella has been working hard in this area. She's known by a number of people in, 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 in New York in the metropolitan area. So she's lucky and she gets to see that. And that's why her perspective is so important. And I mean, patients drive into New York City from like Connecticut, New Jersey, like uh, Massachusetts. So it's not just one state. There's like a lot of people who would seek for somebody specially uh, for stills. Right. Uh, lab wise, they become anemic and their anemia. This is what I observed. Their anemia can drop. They can drop a hematocrit from 38 to 28 in a matter of two weeks. And it's not hemodilution. And you know, when the, the hematocrit drops, you know what else drops is their weight and their albumins. They all parallel together. And it's due to excessive cytokine production. Mainly IL-1 would be my guess, but it could be IL-18. It could be um, IL-6, a number of other mediators, but it is rapid. They noticed a peak, mean peak uh, leukocytosis of 23,000. That's higher than my experience, where about, which is more like 15 to 18,000, but their range was five to 36,000 and 80% of patients had a WBC greater than 18,000. The SED rate had a mean peak of 86 with a range up to 125 and they were all seronegative. Any of you have a um, tidbit on labs that you want to impart on the audience? You know, the IL-18 levels or something, it's, that's not very easily available. Um, cytokine panels, even standard cytokine panels, it's difficult. So you you still got to go through this and ferritin in the regular labs uh, to assess treatment options. Yeah. Haven't you seen a leukocytosis sometimes greater than 50,000? I've seen three. Yeah. Three, but not many. If you're seeing white counts greater than 50,000, you need to be thinking about malignancy and, and other causes more so than stills, but it does occur. I yeah, mean, that's what's striking. Yeah, that's, that's really true. I want to part on the audience that ferritin levels, and Bella, you can correct me, but ferritin levels, hyper extreme ferritin levels, you know, greater than 2000, probably less than 50% of patients with stills. We have a love of ferritin, which is probably inappropriate if you ask me, where a sed rate and CRP are elevated in over 90% of individuals. What I did in, in, in reviewing the 21 patients in Pittsburgh, I showed that amongst in their patients, 50% had a sed rate greater than 90 and 90% had a sed rate greater than 50. And that was about what you, what you were seeing as far as acute phase reactions. True. So, I mean, ferritin helps you sometimes, but not always. And sometimes people are like, oh, the ferritin is normal. The patient doesn't have stills. So that's something that I really would caution against. You, you know, uh, if everything still points out, you need to think about it. Something that most people don't know about, and I, I would encourage people to use the best biomarker that is commercially available that you can use right now, I believe, is aldolase. Aldolase is going to be elevated in patients who have extreme systemic inflammatory symptomatology. It indicates IL-1 responsiveness. If you check a CPK, the CPK is normal, but the aldolase is going to be like 12 to 35 and it will parallel disease. And it's a very good biomarker. I learned this from the pediatric rheumatologist in Dallas, which, you know, that all started with Chester Fink many, many years ago. And then Lynn Pinero and Virginia Pasquale and others. So um, and where else, where else, Jack, do you see aldolase out of proportion to CPK, what else does that tell you? Um, I don't know. I'm going to ask uh, the former chief of rheumatology at Cedar sinai no. Are you going to tell me about inclusion body myositis or something? Sure, like that? you've got to look for other kind of weird things that occur under those circumstances. Right. Yeah. Well, aldolase in this case is coming from liver. Okay, and, and not from muscle is most likely the cause. We don't know that for certain. But obviously, you can get aldolase elevated in extreme liver damage, extreme liver disease. Um, so I, that would be yeah. my answer to your question. But there may be some other myopathies where aldolase may out, outdo the CPK. So let me ask Bella, in, in where, what is your therapeutic approach uh, to these Well, let's cases? just look at, the, let's look okay. at what they did. Um, <laughs> again, Bella doesn't know about what happened in the dark ages when we only had aspirin and indomethacin at the NIH, it was aspirin TID, QID to achieve really yeah. high levels or indomethacin 200 milligrams a day. But as you can see on the bottom, they had cases of aspirin hepatitis, aspirin GI induced ulcers, but that's all they had. They used steroids, but they didn't describe it a lot at the NIH. Mm -hmm. They were very much into alternate day steroids back then. 
uh, and that was their 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 guidance: sixty to one hundred and twenty milligrams every day or every other day. Um, but obviously, it's different now. I I mean, I I still know some people who do every other day steroids, but I don't know the rationale. To be to be fair, uh, Della, do you use a uh, an IL one inhibitor like Anakimer as a diagnostic test? Sometimes, yes, yes. Because problem is, with IL one inhibition will make flu fever go away, make the fever of lymphoma go away. I've well, I've had by, those cases. By then, by that time, hopefully you've ruled <laughs> ruled out. Yeah, you would that. think. You would think, uh, but it's not, it's it, it is a nice empiric maneuver, but to say it's diagnostic might be overreaching, in my opinion. All right, that's why I asked the question. Somebody who's on the ground, seeing this vast number of patients, right? So what, what is your initial approach, Bella, other than, I mean, it obviously depends. make I think a diagnosis. first thing is still steroids. I mean, if they are steroid responsive versus not. Uh, and then, uh, you know, sometimes you try, if you're, really sh if you're sure you do a long acting IL-1, otherwise you try a short acting, see how things go. Um, and again, it's a lot of it is insurance driven, <laughs> at least in the outpatient world. Um, but one question, I mean, aspirin, so do you do aspirin levels every day to when you give these sort of doses? Not uncommon back then. It was more yeah. not every day, but more like, you know, two times or three times a week. And okay. then and then once you achieved over 25. And, and again, if you look at the early literature, as I did when I was a resident um, and looking at these cases in the 70s and 80s, 50% um, of patients responded to anti-inflammatory therapy with NSAIDs or aspirin alone. Yeah, I mean, even in this paper, they are saying that like four of them did went into what we call now as remission, didn't have any symptoms just on these things. Right. I I don't know. I don't. I mean, most patients have already tried NSAIDs quite a lot before they come to see. But this is high dose. Us. This is really high dose. You know, trying a few Advil is not going to make the difference. Or a thousand of naproxen, I think, is below what this is this is showing. And I think it goes to the same point um, that I think. And I think you're right to say this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, what doesn't make any sense to me is trying prednisone at 10, 20, 30 milligrams. I mean, these people need one milligram, two milligrams per kilogram to control systemic disease. Much less for arthritis, but for systemic disease, they need high doses. All right. But that can't last more than a month. So mm. when you're talking about persistent treatment over three to six months, Bella, what, what's your approach? To be fair, I do try methotrexate in arthritis prominent patients, and it does help a few patients. And I still try, it's, you know, it's easier, like daily, daily IL-1, it has rashes, it has problems, you know, the patient's calling you every day, they're, so I try methotrexate in like sort of milder cases, but if patients are like spiking fevers every day and not doing well, I try Anakinra, or if I'm sure I directly try like long acting IL-1 agents. Kind of and thing. what's the role for IL-6 inhibition? I, I, I think I, my preference is IL-1. Okay. I go to IL-6 when I am out of options or there's some other reason that drives me like arthritis is not getting controlled. Have you seen these very severe, you know, eosinophilic drug reactions so when you again, use these drugs? I haven't. And I have used quite a bit of these drugs. I think, again, like it's the selection bias too in these papers, like these centers, whoever, I mean, it's so difficult to get like genetic testing of patients, like just in the outpatient regular clinic world. Um, so, so yes, that, there is. This is a chance, but I, I don't. I haven't seen any, which is well. It points out something very interesting because the geneticists in in Vivian paper you know, are telling us that they think that the HLA associations actually are stronger for the most severe drug reactions than they are for the severity of the disease. That is, uh, that is the HLA is telling us more about um, strength of a drug reaction than it is about the disease itself. And, you know, you go back in years and think about it, you know, there have been HLA associations with gold toxicity, Jack, that came out of Dallas. Uh, yeah, but there have been, again, HLA typing has been done on a number of cohorts with Stills disease 
And other than B HIBW35 being associated with, you know, good systemic outcomes and, you know, HLA-DR4 or, or DR-beta-1 alleles being associated with bad arthritis outcomes, nothing really has panned out until this recent report that centers on a very small number of people with tocilizumab-related dress kind of things. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't think that, um, you know, well, other, the, I let the Stanford the argument is that work on that. Do we know enough to do HLA testing as a uh, pre-therapeutic screen? No, no. Okay, Gigantic I just, waste of money. Just bringing it up. That's Gigantic all. waste of money. I want to remind that the recent um, um, guidelines on the management of systemic disease says, yes, stero steroids is first line, and then go right to IL-1 or IL-6. And, and you don't have to do a lot in between. It's okay to use DMARs like methotrexate, but you can, per the guidelines, go right to IL-1 or IL-6. And Michael, answer, I'll answer your question. Why, when would you use IL-6? Uh, I think the best way we use IL-6 is when I'm having a problem getting IL-1 approved and I can call my stills patient RA and get IL-6 Actemra um, or Ceruliumab approved um, with the idea I'm treating the arthritis even, but that gets into, you know, some other issues on dosing that we, there's an, we're going to discuss next week in our journal club. Then I want us to go over a few unanswered questions in the time we have left. Anybody has questions, they can put them in the Q and a box. There is no diagnostic test imaging or pathology. The duration of disease is unclear and invariable. The meaning of the sore throat. We don't know. It's not seen in kids. It is seen in 70% of adults. It's seen in 10% of kids, but is it, a portal of infection? Is it lymphoid reactivation um, from immune activity? Who knows? Um, again, I don't know about the, uh, every other day steroids. Uh, and then this is what they, they summarize. So in the end, this is what, you know, the, the, the syndrome looks like if you compare the first, they, you know, 24 cases reported by Bywaters and Bujak, and they have some differences, but they also have, which may reflect the centers, like the um, way Bywaters did it in England versus the way the NIH and Shelley Wolf did it at, uh, in, in, in the United States. But I think together, this gives you a really good feel for how this condition should be um, diagnosed. Okay. Managed, I don't think you're going to learn a lot about management <laughs> from these papers because as, as Bella has started, has been scratching her head in, on these uh, slides, you know, who in their right mind is going to use, you know, um, you know, doses of what is it, 90 to 100 milligrams per kilogram to get those drug levels. Um, it'd be insane to do that, especially as Bella pointed out, there's a high rate of LFT and liver involvement and cases of liver failure in patients who got steroids, and I'm sorry, non steroidals and aspirin for their systemic disease. So, well, I think if Bella orders a salicylate level at HSS, they may send her to counseling or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's look at, um, I think we have a few questions from the audience. And again, the audience, if you go into the chat, you'll see the citations. Steve Hall mentions that the, the original Petersdorf and Beeson paper included um, several who had typical Stills disease. Yes. If you look at FUO series, um, Stills disease in the adult is the number one rheumatic cause of FUO in many, many papers with Percentages ranging from as low as like 5% to as high as 12%. Bella, is that your experience in FUO workups? Sorry, I didn't get that question again. Do, 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 are you discovering stills patients who get hospitalized specifically for FUO and later it's diagnosed as stills? Is that still yeah, a common so, so, Yeah, I mean, I think most of those patients are MAS patients in the ICU, like very, very sick having spiking fevers. So those are the inpatients, I would say, which have like a whole lot of FUO workup and then rheumatology is called. In the outpatient world, I think there's some, not that much. Right. Um, Steve also mentions that um, if you ask a paper, patient to take a hot shower, sometimes it can bring the rash out. Not sure what, what that really proves, um, but I have, I've, I've read that. I've seen it a few times. I don't know that it's truly helpful and worth people jumping in and out of showers for diagnostic reasons. Yeah. And then Christian um, Dequette says that aldolase has been found to be elevated in eosinophilic fasciitis. That's kind of an interesting um, point in response to Dr. Weissman's question. So um, closing comments, Michael? 
I think this was great, Jack. I tried to be a little provocative here, specifically asking about the genetics. I think, um, I think, I think this is a really good discussion. I think Bella is great. I'm really glad she's there seeing those patients. Uh, and uh, she's the person I'll call when there's a problem. That's great. Uh, and so I think this, is, this has really been, this has been, been very interesting and certainly worth not watching the introduction to the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. It's a much better deal here. Uh, Bella, what, what, what closing comments do you have? It's, I mean, it's been great learning about stills and the history of stills. There's so many nuances that you don't just get to read. It's more about talking to experienced people like you all. Um, and I think, I mean, both of these papers are still so seminal, like just reading them even right now can fully describe a Stills disease patient, including histology. Like they've, they've done synovial biopsies. Sure. These are the things that you can teach a medical student who doesn't know any of that. This is like a Stills disease book chapter. That's a paper. Sure. Bywaters introduced autoinflammatory diseases and told us Mm. They are very different than diseases characterized by uh, antigen antibody complexes. So, the, I mean, this is, that was, it was beautiful. And he says, you know, I'm going to discuss it with my friends, Muckle and Wells. We thought that exactly. was. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't that, so wasn't that an, a cool comment? Yeah. Um, so he, he knew what he was doing. Um, Robert Connett from New Orleans asks, what other diagnoses um, would be a true, or, or are often mistaken for Stills disease. Um, Bella, do you have your top few? And what I do think, you do? I, I think this, uh, it, it's unfortunate, but a lot of patients with Stills disease have like evening fevers, some rashes here and there. They're diagnosed with fibromyalgia for a long period of time sometimes, <laughs> which is unfortunate. And the patients are miserable for a long time. Um, in terms of like, I, I think a lot of patients are treated as RA and talked, I mean, maybe they just forget the fever component sometimes. And like the arthritis component is treated as with methotrexate, then rituximab, sorry, then uh, Umera, then rituximab, like, you know, that is the line, like a typical RA patient that they are treated. And then it it's takes them a while easy. to get to this diagnosis of stills, um, just because they start a line of treatment already. So again, this is a syndrome. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, I would strongly recommend that, that anyone considering this diagnosis, go and you look at the criteria um, my criteria, the Amaguchi criteria, you can go to our, our new um, website, stillsnow.com. We have a, a disease activity calculator and a diagnosis calculator check boxes. It'll tell you which criteria you meet between the, the, the published criteria that are out there. And that helps you to at least make the right diagnosis in moving forward. And I also want to uh, pitch the idea that this month we're putting out a lot on stills disease for a good reason. And Bella had a really nice blog yesterday she wrote uh, about Stills disease as a complicated disorder that has its complications. Uh, and I think that's a worthwhile read that you can find on Stills on the front page of, uh, of our Room Now website um, uh, today and tomorrow and whatnot. So uh, hope you enjoyed this. We're going to have a, um, uh, a presentation, another um, uh, journal club next week, where we're going to discuss the seminal canakinumab and tocilizumab, the, um, uh, the consider study in canakinumab that led to canakinumab being FDA approved for adult onset stills and the tender trial in tocilizumab in kids with systemic JA that led to that being FDA approved for children with systemic JA. Very uh, interesting articles. Uh, I believe we're gonna to have discussions of Olga Petrina and Hermine Brunner um, on that journal club. So make sure you tune in next Tuesday night. Tell your friends. Uh, this will be on Room Now if you want to share the video or the podcast in, in the next few days. Okay. Michael, Bella, thanks very much for your time. Thank, Thank you, Jack. So